Red Dwarf is the sitcom that boldly goes where no sitcom has gone before. He's a smeg. Hey. I've been called Smeggin every day of my life since 1988. Step up to Red Alert. Uh, sir, are you absolutely sure? It does mean changing the bulb. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything better. Great scripts, the opportunity to perform them, that's what Red Dwarf's all about. Its spaced out adventures have been making us laugh for over 30 years, and the voyage continues. I didn't think that 30 odd years later I'd still be sticking on the dreadlocks and the leather jacket. Oh, look, I've been popping up! <laughs> it's very age inappropriate now, let me tell you. In this series, we get the inside story on the world's most celebrated sci fi comedy from the people who made it. I'm almost annoyed. I'm 100% unaware of the mask. I haven't got a clue that I've got a mask on. I'm just crying. I humbly name this moon Rimmer. The character of Rimmer, I don't think I base it on anyone in particular. I couldn't find anyone on the planet who was quite that sad. We both said that at the same time. <laughs> and that. You'll never get bored of being in Red Dwarf because you don't know where they're going to take you next. Here it comes! Over the next hour, we'll be rewinding time. One rumble! They just ring every possible gag that you want to happen in a backwards episode. <laughs> Looking at how Red Dwarf predicted the future. Alexa, is the flight that? That's Holly. It's all come real. And we reveal how, in another universe, the series headed to Hollywood. Well, my full name is Crichton 2XB517P. <laughs> Dave Lister. I didn't want to do an American series of Red Dwarf. <laughs> it was a very different thing. So sit back, slob out, and enjoy the first three million years of Red Dwarf. Still on board, looking for a way home in a really hot curry. I am Talker Doll. <laughs> Who'd have thought it? For decades now, the good ship Red Dwarf has mined real-world science as fuel for a sitcom. And it all started during the show's formative years, when Red Dwarf creators Rob Grant and Doug Naylor found a way to turn genuine scientific theory into classic comedy. Part of the brilliance of Red Dwarf was that the writers had a really good firm grip of what was happening in science at the time. Normally, you start talking about science to anyone um, that's not interested in it, you've got about five seconds to make an impact. Red Dwarf is based on real science, um, theoretical science, and possibly, as important as any, made-up science. So what is it? I've never seen one before. No one has, but I'm guessing it's a white hole. A white hole? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. A black hole sucks time and matter out of the universe. A white hole returns it. Black holes we knew about. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, we made up white holes. Uh, but it now turns out that that's actually, you know, a possibility. No one has seen a white hole. We have we have mathematical uh, evidence that white holes might might exist. But actually, if you really want to understand what what a white hole might look like, what actually it might be, I can suggest no better resource than watching that particular episode of Red Dwarf. Is that thing spewing time back into the universe? Precisely. That's why we're experiencing these curious time phenomena on board. So what is it? I've never seen one before, no one has, but I'm guessing it's a white hole. It took me a while to work out that was my role, when there was a complex concept behind the plot. So what is it? <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> OK, so it's decided then. We consult Holly. Hey, wait a minute. I missed a discussion. We all did. Time is occurring in random pockets. The laws of causality no longer apply. An action no longer leads to a consequence. So what is it? I think we've experienced this period of time before, sir. Only joking. And that one. There's a leak in the space-time continuum. And in order to get the really good joke that Danny gets to do as the cat, 
it needs a huge explanation from Crichton. Time travel really is one of the central tropes of all science fiction writing because it gives you unlimited plots, it gives you unlimited scenarios. Perhaps Lister here would like to go over to the fridge and open a bottle of wine for Lister and Lister. Rimmer here doesn't drink because he's dead, but I wouldn't mind a glass. <laughs> I don't want anyone to get into a flat here, but I'm the Rimmer who's from the Double Double. <laughs> I'm the Rimmer who's with the Lister who married Kachansky. Now, from this point on, things get a little bit confusing. <laughs> like all good time travel stories, there are, there are ways of manipulating the arrow of time, ways of going back in time. So Time Slides, for example, is one of my favourite episodes where they have photographs of moments in history that actually become portals that let them go back in time. That's Nuremberg. That's Adolf Hitler. He was leader of the runners-up in World War II. I covered the photograph in one of your magazines. Which magazine? Yeah, the Fascist Dictator Monthly. He was Mr. October. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. They were doing these self-contained, very funny, joke-dense comedy scripts that also had lots of really complicated science fiction elements to them in half an hour. Starbug is going to fire a thermonuclear device into this sun here, creating a solar flare which is going to knock that planet out of orbit and send it rocketing across space and into a white hole, presumably blocking it up. Let me get this straight. Is she doing what I think she's doing? Wow, what do you think she's doing? Playing pool with planets. And I've learnt more science being on Red Dwarf in 31 years than I ever learnt at school. We know the arrow of time flows one direction, but there's nothing in physics that says time couldn't work both ways. <laughs> there's an episode called Backwards where they go to Earth and, and because the big crunch has happened, it's, everything's rewinding. So they've got some sort of slapstick comedy in about people eating and drinking backwards and walking backwards and all of this sort of thing. But, again, it's rooted in some real science. It's possible that at a point at which, where the universe reaches its widest expansion, it will start to contract and everything will start to go back in time. With science fiction, you want to sort of give people a sense that you're getting a taste of a world that exists in so much more detail around what you're actually just seeing. Because then you can do really high concept episodes. Nodnol, 871 Selin. Nodnol, where's Nodnol? It's London, London, 178 miles. It's backwards. Comedically, they just ring every possible gag that you want to happen in a backwards episode. Bye, suckers! You lost your bye! Shh, stop peddling and stop peddling! <laughs> It was really tricky because what we drew is obviously record forwards, thinking about what it would look like when it's run backwards. One rumble! <laughs> I'm now going, OK, so this starts wide, it finishes close, but it's going to run backwards, so you're going to start close, then finish wide, then I've got to cut to a shot backwards or forwards. Excuse me, oh. have you two back? <laughs> It was hard, and then we were shooting on location, and, and Craig would have to walk backwards out of the water, so it looked, you know, lots of tricky stuff. <laughs> Lily died when I walked backwards in the river, though. I had to walk backwards into a river, and then they were going to rewind the tape, and it looked like I walk out of the river, and when I get to the bank, I'm totally dry. So anyway, I walked backwards into the river, water filled into me biker boots, all the silt went in. Um, I'm holding my breath, I can't hear anyone shout action. And so I think, oh, I... I can't help. And then I couldn't move like that. And Peter Rank had to pull me out of the water. Good fun, though. I went back and did it again. <laughs> we just taped up my boots. <laughs> All of that stuff that you find in Red Dwarf isn't just mad fantasy created from sort of the imaginations of two guys. You can have your mind blown and you can laugh along with some concept and then you can go and look it up and find actually some of these things are possible, which is just cool. I think that's what's genius about it, is that they take things that are so imprinted in your mind and just turn it on its head. I've never seen anything like as audacious as that, I think, in a sitcom premise. To run the whole reams of dialogue in reverse, it was, it was pretty extraordinary. Now on our sword pedal, now smart ship up with that. Oh, he's kind of there, you know. In the original episode, Arthur Smith delivers a line which was broadcast backwards. 
for the first time on British television, here's what he actually said. You are a stupid, square-ended, bald git, aren't you? I'm pointing at you, I'm pointing at you, but I'm not actually addressing you. I'm addressing the one prat in the country who's bothered to get hold of this recording, turn it round and actually work out the rubbish that I'm saying. What a poor, sad life he's got! Coming up, we go dimension jumping from Rimmer... Oh, I'm getting a bit of a flutter for Ace Rimmer. ..to rodents. <laughs> You know, the guy I've been working with for 30 years in a rat costume. It's just another day at work. And the boys from the Dwarf swap spaceships for a very different type of transport. My horse was the last horse in the stables, wasn't he? I mean, he was the one... He was a slightly, you know, I'm not all here. <laughs> the whole of time and space simply isn't big enough to accommodate the sheer amount of ingenious ideas in Red Dwarf. Luckily, thanks to scientific theory, there's an infinite number of other universes out there too. It's in our nature as humans to want to go beyond the horizon. And actually physics, you know, the conclusion of modern physics is that parallel universes, the multiverse, the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics is actually a, a real thing. Over the years, Red Dwarf has happily skipped through multiple universes. Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. But perhaps one of the strangest ones featured a cultured lister and a very different role for Danny John Jules. Mr Rimmer, sir, will you be joining myself, Mr Lister and Mr Brad for dinner? Of course I... <laughs> Mr Who? I've known Danny for over 30 years. I've seen him do all sorts of voices and all sorts of characters and all sorts of this, but that sort of guttural rat voice just came from nowhere. Yo, Craddy! <laughs> Where am I dinner at? <laughs> in one dimension, he's a cat, like, up here. Ow! And then in another dimension, he's a rat down here. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> He's so warm and snuggly! That costume was unbelievably hot. He could only wear it for about three minutes and he'd have to take it off. You know, what? it's not until the lights hit you. Because you've got to remember, not only is it the rat suit, I had a fur coat on top of the rat suit and the chain and the head. You can't just pull it off, someone's got to get it off you. Cheese sauce on your cheese, sir. Hell yeah! You know, the guy I've been working with for 30 years in a rat costume. It's just another day at work. But when it came to the ultimate parallel persona, Arnold Rimmer went from zero to hero. Ace Rimmer came about, and I, I'm flabbergasted by this, but Chris said he was bored playing Rimmer because he was such a loser. And so we then created Ace Rimmer, who was everything um, Rimmer wasn't. Well, Chris was amazing as Ace Rimmer, his sort of Tom Cruise counterpart. And you think, God, <laughs> you kind of go, oh, I'm getting a bit of a flutter for Ace Rimmer. <laughs> Step up a motor mall, girl. Smoke me a kipper. I'll be back for breakfast. Chris, of course, put the wig on and then he became sort of, you know, a space James Bond. Well, the first time I saw Chris as Ace Rimmer, I think Chris said to me, this is the real Rimmer. That other guy is the imposter. <laughs> it was just out of joy of seeing that completely other side of Chris, so he was so convincing, is that? And he was so brave. My name's Commander Rimmer, Arnold Rimmer. Friends call me Ace. I've come from another dimension. Explain later. But first of all, let's get you out of this picture. What do they call you, matey? Uh, Crushing, sir. Series 4000 Mechanoid, am I right? Sold to the Space Corps. Most important thing, of course, in that, that first outing for Ace was the wig. You won't thank me for saying this, but I think he wore the wig for a little bit too long. You know, like, did he really have to wear it home? Well, that's mosey on into town. <laughs> Virtual reality also allowed the crew to experience other dimensions, like the time they cosplayed as cowboys for Gunmen of the Apocalypse. But not all were easy riders. Here at the world-famous Pinewood Studios, rehearsals are taking place for a feature-length episode of Red Dwarf. And during a break, we caught up with the boys from the Dwarf for an exclusive chat. You didn't enjoy that, did you? <laughs> well, 
Yes, I, I, a horse is not a motorbike. Controls on a motorbike kind of make it do certain things, you know, like go forward and stop. Mm. Um, a horse is slightly different because you were a very accomplished horseman. I don't think Dan, so, but I had a very accomplished yeah. horseman. You had a relatively docile horse. You, <laughs> not, you were, you're not an accomplished horseman, I know I've, that. I've done a bit of riding, but like, I, watch, I'm not, I just wasn't scared of it at all. No, and, but my horse was the last horse in the stables, wasn't he? I mean, he was the one. He was a slightly, you know, I'm not all here. And as soon as, soon as you went, uh, I, well, I slapped it on the top. You slapped it, and you went yee-haw! yeehaw! And of course, my fellow took off. When one runs, they go, oh, we're doing running, and yeah. they did running. But I was a bit behind, and I could see these people. We went across what was the car park mm. in the field and there were people running from all directions towards an open gate onto a busy main road. Yeah. <laughs> Señorita, resta aquí la fofofora. What? Oh, Danny, the Riviera kid. I think that's one of... Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. But the Riviera kid, uh, of that course... That costume was amazing. What would the cat be if he was a cowboy? Yeah. I mean, you look at them, you know, he's not going to be the saddle tramp, you know, he's going to be the Mexican. Very smooth. I was expecting something with a little more kick to it. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Well, the whole idea about that dun, 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 was, you know, in all the cowboy films, every time the Mexicans came on, yeah, they yeah. played Spanish music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who in the heck are you? They call me the kid. The Riviera kid. Well, Riviera kid, let's see if your shooting's as fancy as your dancing. I was really jealous. I wanted to be the gunman. What's a knife, man? Yeah. What's all that about? That's yeah. a bit shy, isn't it? And that was your moment, wasn't it? That was that brilliant. Was, no, 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 no. Stand back. I, it's the only time in the whole show I've had to get the, you guys stand back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, st and we this, stood back. This is a job for you. And it didn't disappoint. Gunmen of the Apocalypse won an international Emmy in 1994, proof that Red Dwarf is a hit in any dimension. Engage the triplicator. The Red Dwarf universe is littered with fantastic devices designed to perform the miraculous. And all of them are about as reliable as the gadgets we use today. Extraordinary. The other thing I like about the sort of technology in Red Dwarf as well is that it's really, really annoying, just like technology now. Howdy doodly do. How's it going? <laughs> I'm Talkie. Talkie Toaster, your chirpy. Breakfast companion. Talkies, the name, toasting's the game. Anyone like any toast? Look, I don't want any toast, and he doesn't want any toast. In fact, no one around here wants any toast. Not now, not ever. No toast. How about a muffin? Or oh, muffin. Talky Toaster was voiced by actor David Ross, who had previously played the original version of Crichton. The voice from Talky came, I think, just from the kind of things he was talking about. You know, he was kind of always on the up. Sort of an upbeat character. He wasn't depressing or he wasn't trying to bring people down, I don't think. He was a fairly jo jolly sort of character, which I think is nice for a toaster. <laughs> I think all toasters should be jolly. <laughs> we want no muffins, no toast, no tea cakes, no buns, baps, baguettes or bagels, no croissants, no crumpets, no pancakes, no potato cakes and no hot cross buns and definitely no smeg and flapjacks. <laughs> ah, so you're a waffle man. <laughs> Whenever I'm in a supermarket and I get annoyed by unexpected item in the bagging area, I always think back to Red Dwarf and I think of Lister and the Talking Toaster and them having an argument and it being really annoying. No toast! But I'm a toaster. It is my raison d'etre. I toast, therefore I am. 25 years later, David returned to the recording booth to inhabit the universe's most irritating household appliance in series 12. I received a call and they said, do you want to do Talky Toaster again? I said, oh yeah, I'd love to. Talky's the name, toasting's the game. I just have one question. Don't even go there. I know the question. He knows the question. You know the question. We all know the question. Very well. What is it? Would you like some toast? No, I'm fine, thank you. Why, would you like some toast? He was the pinnacle of my career, playing a toaster. I mean, who wants to play King Lear and Richard III? Give me a toaster any day of the week. <laughs> And with the show now on our screens for over 30 years, so much of what Red Dwarf invented as science fiction 
is now becoming fact. It gets more and more relevant the more technology advances. Alexa and stuff like that, that's holly. It's all become real. What's the nearest planet to the sun? Your nearest basic planet to your actual sun is... <laughs> Mercury. Yeah, that's right. Oh, ye of little faith. Late 80s, we'd invented all of this. It just took Apple and Google and all these people a bit of time to catch up. There are also real science where you take um, bioprinting, which obviously is real now, but we just went one step further and bioprinted humans. It was just fascinating for, to, to, be, to see how the plot would unfold into making lots of rimmers. Mr Rimmer, <laughs> we are what we seem. Rim, 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 the cutest quartet that you've ever seen. Rim, 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 we perform our rims rim, rim, and duets times two. Rim, 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 rim. This barbershop quartet is singing for you. <laughs> That is entertainment. To take those two elements and then print human beings <laughs> in a printer where the paper gets jammed, which we've all experienced. <laughs> a great episode for me. Quite hard work, but a uh, great fun episode. A rimmer monster at the end. There's some sinister ideas coming in in series 11 and 12, you know, where everything's owned by a corporation. Your company has been bought by Emcor. You probably have a lot of questions. And you can't see products that are not owned by Emcor. Can you see this? Yes. Can you see this? Yes. And finally, can you see this? <laughs> no. I'm just praying that's an electric toothbrush. <laughs> Things like that are quite sinister, but, like, are becoming reality. Quite dystopian and quite, sort of, harsh and scary. Cos the future might not be all bright, you know. Coming up... All right, lads, how you feeling? Big wonky? A galaxy of guest stars. That felt good! <laughs> and it's Red Dwarf, but not as we know it. Well, my full name is Crichton 2XB517P. Dave Lister. <laughs> the guy who was playing me was so good looking, I would have shagged him. Over the years, Red Dwarf has certainly featured a lot of stars. And not just those in outer space. In fact, some of the biggest names in film and TV have made guest appearances, including Jenny Agutter... Hello, Crichton. Don Warrington, Sarah Alexander and Brian Cox. And you are, sir. Lister of Smeg. <laughs> Good night. You accept this challenge from Lister of Smeg? Why am I going to call him Lister of Smeg? <laughs> Don't worry about it, Brian. Just do your best, mate. You'll be all right. <laughs> And Ainsley Harriet as, as a Gelf, that was, that was quite fun. What? What, you want my hat? <laughs> no one believed it was Ainsley under there, you know. And then, of course, he did Can't Smeg, Won't Smeg. Yes, Ainsley returned to his earthbound persona and reunited with his former castmates for a surreal cooking show crossover in 1998. Let's meet today's first couple, as we are going to play Can't Smeg, Won't Smeg! That was a great bit of ad-lib television, that. Oh, my goodness. Dwayne doing a cooking show. That's what I want. That's going to compliment that beautiful. <laughs> That's lovely. Very nice indeed. Dwayne, beautiful. Beautiful, Dwayne. That's what I like. Timothy Spall, proper actor, let's be honest. Brilliant. All right, lads, how you feeling? Big wonky? Perfectly normal. You're right as right in 20 minutes. When he was on Red Dwarf, he said he found the lines some of the hardest he's ever had to do. He had his memory erased and was programmed to act like a complete prat, so no one suspected. No one's. Sorry. Uh, would be act like a complete prat, so no one suspected his secret mission to destroy Red Dwarf in order to guide Lister to his destiny. I gave him a hug, which may have been too intimate, especially when you got the Crichton costume on, because he got his lines wrong quite a few times when we shot that scene. And, we, and he was really upset because he's a proper actor who doesn't do that. And he went, I can't, you know. I said, honestly, on this set, mate, you're right at home. Do not worry. 
Comedian Johnny Vegas made an unforgettable impression as a pink policeman in 2017, tasked with arresting anyone who dared to criticise. Yeah, but once they outlawed criticism, nobody could criticise the criticism law because it was illegal to criticise! Idiots! Working with Johnny Vegas when he was the crit cop was fascinating because he is one of the top sort of modern uh, comedy talents in the country. When he was working through the rehearsal, getting up to the performance, I mean, most of the time I, I sort of stopped working as Rimmer. I was just watching, watching him create his own performance, and it was just so good. And on the night, he was just first class, you know. Oh. <laughs> I just criticised something, didn't I? God, I've not done that for ages. That felt good. In that same series, in between us, actor James Buckley got to find out what it was like to be a mechanoid. Who are you? I can tell. Why do they keep you down here slaving away when you're the same as them? Same as them? We're not the same as them. They're series 4000 Mark III's. And call the midwife's very own Trixie, Helen George even beamed up for a cameo. Suddenly, this. This face is there of this really, I think, really proper, famous, proper actor. And she came on utterly baffled. <laughs> she'd, been, she'd been living in the 1950s for the last five years in, in Call the Midwife, and suddenly she's on a virtual spaceship. Welcome to MCOR, a paper live virtual integrated environment. Most people who come stay forever. During the show's early days, a recurring guest was 80s pop star turned actress Claire Grogan, who played the object of Lister's desires, Christine Kachansky. It was like a dream come true for me, cos, um, I never told her this, I was too shy, but I used to fancy her like mad when she was in Altered Images. I could be happy, I could be happy. At first I thought I was going to get to kiss her. That never happened. So how are you then? Fine. Do you know what he wants to see me for? Yes, I think you've been promoted to Admiral. Oh, yeah? Yeah, for your diligence and general devotion to duty. Oh, yeah? She was a pop star, and um, I'm just this scally from Liverpool who's a conned his way onto television, and all of a sudden, she's getting to play my girlfriend. I was over the moon. For series seven and eight, Kachansky became a regular character, thanks to another trip to a parallel universe, and she was now portrayed by Chloe Annette. So in this dimension, you didn't die? You're an alternate version of Dave. Well, I like to think of myself as a definitive version, you know, home to perfection by time and evolution. <laughs> I can see why you'd think that, yeah. She changed to someone who's very prim and proper in English. But again, Chloe, brilliant to work with. I'm uh, back with Tim now. Tim? That guy is such a poser. The way he always wears that white suit and that stupid big white floppy hat. He's a chef. <laughs> yeah. The unrequited love, uh, the long lost passion, and I still think he's searching for her. Um, but yes, yeah, the great love affair that never really happened. <laughs> Even some family members have had guest spots, such as Craig Charles' brother Emil, who was the young lister in Time Slides. Guys, guys, I'd like you to meet me, aged 17. Shady! This is totally shady. It's beyond shady, it's surreal. Are these your mates, then? And when a love interest was needed for Crichton, he didn't have to look too far from home, either. Back in the day, of course, one of the biggest stars we ever got was <laughs> my good lady wife. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? Is there something wrong? Sorry, stare mode cancel. It's just you have really amazing eyes. Well, uh, yeah, they're just the old 579s with the automatic 15F stop cornea. <laughs> if you like, I could pop them out and you could borrow them. <laughs> Heck, what a jerky thing to say. Having them rub a mask put on. Yeah, it's all right. Wearing it all day. Yeah, it's all right. OK. <sighs> can, you have some, can you have some problems with it? The costume's really restricted. Ah, it's a costume. Like, nothing. It was no problem for her whatsoever. Here we go, still recording. Stand by. Hang on. She just have to adjust her breasts. Excuse me. In 1992, Robert got to see things from the guest star's perspective when he was the only member of the British cast who appeared in the pilot for an American remake of Red Dwarf. I was really in two minds because I didn't particularly want to do it. I mean, it is that thing where 
you know, a lot of actors who worked in television and they get this opportunity to go and work in Hollywood would bloody jump at the chance. But I've never particularly want, wanted, to, I know it sounds silly, but I've never really wanted to be an actor. Must have made a wrong turn somewhere. You should have made a left at the last intersection, Crichton. <laughs> be quiet, sparehead one. I know what I'm doing. Boy, I hate backseat drivers. <laughs> Craig Bieko, who was later in Sex in the City and has done lots of other things, very funny. He was Lister. He was rather a butch, gorgeous Lister with a six pack and pecs. Jane Leaves was Holly, who then was in Frasier for many years and very, and very funny and very uh, dry sense of humour. How long have I been in stasis, Holly? Well, I couldn't let you out until the radiation died down to a safe level. Really? You're gonna laugh. How long? <laughs> <laughs> Just under three million years. My baseball cards must be worth a fortune. <laughs> the guy who was playing me was like just this six foot four, handsome Adonis, like, you know, so good looking, I would have shagged him. This mega makeover was light years away from the original idea of the slobbiest man in the universe. <laughs> Lister is not in good physical shape. <laughs> That's the whole concept. And if you don't get that joke, can you try and kind of like make him into like a good looking, not that Craig Charles isn't good looking, but when you try and Americanize it, it kind of like loses something. I uh, got into a drinking game. One minute I'm sitting in a bar in Detroit. Next thing I know, I'm waking up on a park bench on the fourth moon of Saturn wearing absolutely nothing but a traffic cone on my head. The thing about making a successful pilot is you've got to have a perfect marriage between script and casting. And I thought the US pilot was full of really good actors, but it didn't quite match the characters, uh, the Red Dwarf characters. And so that's, that's why it didn't work. Unsurprisingly, Red Dwarf's American adventure was a brief one and only the pilot was made. You're a robot, right? <laughs> it shows. <laughs> when I was digging up carrots in my garden and heard from Robin Doug that it had been pulled and it wasn't happening, the relief was palpable. I didn't want to do an American series of Red Dwarf. It would have been... It was a very different thing. Coming up, the fans dressed to impress. Some of the, the costumes were just extraordinary, you know? And who do you think you're kidding, Mr Hitler? <laughs> Jamming with Hitler, one of my favourite scenes, that. I mean, bucket list stuff, that. Red Dwarf has seen many changes across 30 years. But one thing has never changed, and that's the incredible devotion of its fans. Since 1992, dwarfers across the country have flocked to the Dimension Jump convention to mingle with the cast and have an out-of-this-world experience. It is three days of having a lot of smegging fun. It's just the most amazing weekend any Red Dwarf fan could ever have. Some of the costumes were just extraordinary. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I saw a Rimmer once that had a better costume than, well, than Chris. It was a better costume than was in the show. I, yeah. I yeah. absolutely saw a Rimmer. I, I said to him, I said, man, that's better than Chris's costume. I did see someone with a Lister jacket and it was painted so good. I said, I said how did you get that? Did yeah, you yeah, buy yeah. that at auction or something like that? And no, I made it myself, but it was like exactly. Wow. The fan that I remember as the most extraordinary, I think, is the kid that used to come who's paralysed from the neck down, and he came to the... and he just did the fancy dress yes. competition. Yes, yes! And he came he with the amazing. Cube one, the Crichton Cube one. <laughs> Crichton <laughs> Cube, do you remember? I mean, and then what about the... Do you remember, his dad used to wheel him in on his bed. Yeah. And he'd be dressed up. I mean, that, to me, was the... And he loved it. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That's extraordinary, that was... Well, I remember you getting in a, a, a... There was a disabled kid came to see, and he had an electric wheelchair with a mm -hmm. handle, and he was really sweet. And I think he was with his dad or his brother. Yeah. Did he give me a go? Yeah. <laughs> well, did he get... You pulled him out of his chair, gave him to me, I had to hold him up. <laughs> and then you got in his chair. But of course, he loved it, because <laughs> Lister had been in his chair. <laughs> I can't remember. I think that might have been Birmingham. This lovely lady about my age, possibly fractionally older, came up with, a, you know, with an H on her forehead and wanted a picture, and I went... There you go, and then she said, oh, and this is my daughter, and I look up, and there's a woman about 45 with an H on her head, 
And I, and I go, oh, how are you doing? Well, what's your name? And then another a woman about 25 comes up with an H on her head, and then there's a pram with a little girl in it with an H on her head, and that was four generations of women. Have you seen the guy who's, who's See, tattooed as me Google face on his car? Yeah. yeah, both tattoos. It's it's like, scary. I've got a couple of tits, a calf, and a bum. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Do you remember um, Jane? Do you remember Jane? Jane, Jane the, the, the fan club girl, I, I, at the back. It's like a, it's like yeah. a, um, a red dwarf. She got the, she got yeah. the ship with all our faces. Yeah. Oh, mate. It's like, it's like, yeah. It looks like it hurts. Yeah. I mean. No, the fans that really, you know, get me the most are the ones who sort of, you know, come up and, the, you know, they've had some bad experiences and they, yeah. and they sort of say, with without the show, yeah. I wouldn't have got oh, through, That's happened. you know, I've got messages was, on my you know? phone from a guy who said, if it wasn't for Red Dwarf, I definitely wouldn't oh, be no, here now. No. But the success of the series is not confined to these shores. Red Dwarf is now a global phenomenon, having been shown in 25 countries worldwide. It is quite global, though. I mean, I went to Croatia recently to do a festival. It was the first time I'd been to Croatia, and I got warned, like, some of these Eastern European countries are not that cool with people of colour and all that. Yeah. So, anyway, I comes out of the airport, and all these people are looking at me, and I'm thinking, oh, this is not going to be good. So I, I walk towards the taxi, and, and, and the guy's just looking at me. I thought, Jesus, have I, have I just increased the black population by 100% or something like that? And he just comes to me and goes, are you Dave Lister? I went, what? And the whole of the taxi, all the taxi drivers crowded around me, yeah. saying, can I have an autograph? Can I have an autograph? Wow. Because apparently it's really big in Croatia. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. And the Czech Republic. And yeah, the Czech like, Republic, yeah. aren't you? It was crazy. Happened to be in Australia, going through customs, and this guy wanted to search my bags. And some woman next to him said, no, um, no, he's OK. Uh, go on, have a good day, Mr Lister, sir. You know, wow. like, you know... Oh, oh, one of the other customs yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Have a good day, Mr wow. Lister, sir. You're like, what is going on here, you know? But we signed a pregnant woman's belly in Seattle. Do you remember yeah. that? That was after the boy that ran up and said, what does Smeg mean? Hi. What does Smeg mean? <gasps> I remember one in Chicago with you, and there was a long queue. There was a Japanese girl, uh, and she got all the way there, walked past me, wasn't interested in me, stood in front of you and just went... Fainted. Just fainted. She'd yeah. been in the queue an Ow. hour and a half. Yeah. And she got to me and fainted, didn't get her autograph, didn't get a photograph, and she got carried out. <laughs> I think you did see her afterwards, I think. I seem to remember. But you just got... Yeah. Poof. Ladies, Even when the BBC decided not to continue production and Red Dwarf disappeared from our TV screens for a decade, the fans stayed loyal. And in 2009, that love was rewarded when the boys from The Dwarf returned. Red Dwarf was being repeated on UK TV, on the Dave channel, and then they came to us and said, look, we'd be really interested in getting the guys back into costume and then maybe introducing some clips, which was when I suggested if you're going to do that, why don't we make more Red Dwarfs? We got on the set, everyone in costume, and we all looked at each other and we all said, it feels like we've had a weekend off. It felt instantly 100% familiar. A lot of people don't want to be associated with an old show because it looks like they haven't moved on in their career and you've got all that. People used to say to me, oh, aren't you scared of being typecast? No. Where am I going to get another show that's got a character like the cat in? The new series on Dave saw fiction meeting reality and played on Craig Charles's own multiverse existence, as at the time of filming, not only was he Dave Lister, he was also taxi driver Lloyd Mullaney on the street. It was like my two worlds colliding, so that kind of just blew my, my mind. Hi, guys. What are you doing here? Ah, Mr. Charles, sir. My name is Crichton. I'm a fictitious character from the television series Red Dwarf, and we really need your help. You're the only one that can help us, man. Since 1995, Doug Naylor has been in sole charge of continuing the Red Dwarf story, and further adventures have followed on Dave. During this time, the crew have reunited Rimmer with his brother. When we found Crichton, he was a burnt-out wreck on a junk heap. And you rebuilt him. Give him something to live for. No, we just hosed him down and gave him a hat. <laughs> the cat's been pregnant. And they've even met the Messiah. Jesus! <laughs> yes? <What? laughs> Having that long break 
I think we were all so glad to be back that it gave us that energy. And especially in series 10, 11 and 12, the energy is, woof, it's through the roof, you know. Check out these subwoofers. <laughs> Crichton having a midlife crisis. I was doing really classic dad dancing. <laughs> One of my favourite images of Crichton is in that his ridiculous, stupid red suit. It was great fun. Jamming with Hitler, one of my favourite scenes, that. I mean, bucket list stuff, that. <laughs> Originally, the song was going to be uh, Africa by Toto. Because we couldn't get the rights to Toto's Africa. And everything we were trying to get the rights for, people were going, mm, he's Adolf Hitler, we don't want him to sing it. But this is the nice Hitler now, he'd been cured, remember. <laughs> it was just a riot, and we, we had a ball doing it. If we fire up the bayonets, we can catch that ship in a couple of days. In 2020, a special feature-length episode aired on Dave meaning that Red Dwarf has now appeared on screen in each of the last five decades. <laughs> We've got a kind of quite interesting um, new form here, this 90-minute long live audience sitcom. And I think it's given the whole series a fresh impetus. I'll tell you the point of you. A moon cannot make light, right? And yet there's such a thing as moonlight. It's light reflected off a moon from a sun. Yeah, but the sun can't make moonlight without the moon. And the moon can't make moonlight without the sun. So who's making the moonlight? They both are. Which means that even though a moon cannot make light, moonlight exists. Like you, Smeghead. Red Dwarf is still reaching for the stars. But what does the future hold? This just doesn't seem to be any stopping of this train. It's just mad. Crichton, set a course for Red Dwarf. The slime's coming home. <laughs> we just keep going. I would like to see it go on for as long as we feel it's right. Robert's already in a nappy. That's not a costume he's wearing. I've got the same amount of energy I had when I was 30, but for a really short period. It runs out really fast, so I can still reach that... <laughs> I'd like to do as many episodes as we can while he's still got his own teeth. We are those guys. Old gits in space. And as Robert said when we last got together, he said, Dan, I'm 60 years old, and I've got a giant condom on my head. It's great, isn't it? I started doing Red Dwarf when I was 23. It's been with me my whole adult life. I've formed amazing friendships. I've got fans worldwide who are really appreciative of it. And that's something to be proud of.